oriented that way to begin to raise awareness for that or about that. So 100,000 people die every year from alcohol-related diseases, cancer, cirrhosis, heart disease, diabetes. And that's the year 2000 stat. So you can't drink when you're dead, so those consumers must be replaced, and so that's what alcohol advertising in this country is designed to do, replace those folks. So I like the following information placed on every unit. <laughs> Just like so people can make an informed choice about how much they drink, as with how much aspirin and ibuprofen or other legally accessible drugs they take. So this information is not available to you by law. The only people who are actually ever have access to this information are cops and defense attorneys and drug counselors. All right, so let's show you... All right, so everyone knows what legally drunk is. 0.08 in this state, right? So, is there any rational reason to exceed legally drunk? And if not, why? Why? Well, you won't die, necessarily, right? You might get sick, maybe. Is there a reason to exceed legally drunk? So you can win the drinking contest. <laughs> That's it. See how much you can drink. Can you hold your liquor? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So it's not that legally drunk is set too low. Legally drunk, based on pharmacology, a strict weight-dose relationship based on blood volume in a medically defined ideal weight body. Now, if you weigh more than your medically defined ideal weight, that doesn't mean you can drink more you still have the same amount of blood. And that's what the issue is. Your brain runs on oxygen dissolved in the blood, and alcohol competes with oxygen in the blood, in the brain, for, in the blood for the brain, with the brain. So, so, blood alcohol level, regardless of your weight. You have the same amount of blood, your tolerance changes, which is why you might not feel drunk even when you are legally drunk. Oh, and I see what happened here. The translation from PC to Mac threw this off. And the Mac shows it as it's supposed to be, and no signal. Okay, let's do this. Pick a weight, any weight, male and female. One fifty female, okay. Like one the docking cam. Yeah, I don't know if it'll work though. Should. I'm actually wanting to understand why this computer is not transmitting, but to do is 
rotate, rotate. Okay. There is a way. Where there is a will, there is a way. If you can get that centered and enlarged a bit, it's still really hard to read over yeah. there. Okay. <laughs> All right. Which weight did we use? 150 for females. Good. Okay. Tell you a story. Young couple, both double-barreled children of alcoholics, that is, both sets of parents were practicing alcoholics and both sets of grandparents were practicing alcoholics. Whopping genetic tolerance. Captain of the football team, head cheerleader. While I was working at Churchill High School, names have been changed to protect the innocent, but I'm just saying this is a typical couple within sports, all right? So uh, Churchill beat South. They had a celebratory party. She was the designated driver, which, you know, this is teenagers, right? So designated driver means you don't drink in the adult world, but in the teenage world, she drank less, yeah. right? See the logic here? Mm -hmm. She totaled the vehicle which was one of those big kind of penis car Toyota trucks that are raised with that are monster with the roll bar and all that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So they lived because of the roll bar and they were belted in, but totaled the truck. So that resulted in a referral to the friendly neighborhood drug counselor at Churchill, which was me. So I did the standard, you know, pre-assessment because we don't do treatment in high school, right? but I'm a treatment professional, so we did the standard pre-assessment, start with a drug history. You know, when did you start drinking? How much did you have? Yada, yada, yada. She said she had, well, I started with him first, all right? I drank a six pack, I drank a case. Okay, when do you feel a buzz? Well, I don't feel a buzz till after the, six pack, after the first six pack. I just drank my usual case. She was the designated driver. She, and when I said, how much did you have to her? She said, I had two coolers. Okay, all right. So she weighed uh, 125, but let's say 150, whatever. You, your example is 150, all right? So if you notice, 150 found female, 0 0.10, 0 0.10 at three doses, and a man at three doses, 150-pound male, he's drunk less, even though it's the same amount. The reason is, if you remember your high school biology, secondary sex characteristics, all things being equal, 150-pound female has less blood because he has more muscle mass, takes more blood to run muscle. Secondary sex characteristic, more fat by volume, less blood to run fat. Right? So that's why she gets drunker faster because less blood. Now, what that doesn't factor in is the tolerance because you can't factor that in. It's unpredictable. But we do observe that the longer alcohol has been in your line, the more tolerance you have. Okay, so naive users, often, you know, those figures are basically based on naive users. Can we? Oh, I know, that's right. Okay, so I intentionally, when I show people this chart, there's no point in going beyond 10 when they've exceeded 10. It's already bad, okay? It's already bad. So if you understand that legally drunk is 0.08 and people, when they see this, they go, well, wait, that's too low. I don't even feel hardly a buzz there. Right, you don't. But you still aren't able to form, be perform behind the wheel of an automobile. That's what the test is based on. 
your ability to coordinate and have judgment. So legally drunk, for example, for commercial dr bus drivers and such is 0.04, all right? Because it's at 0.04 where you lose judgment. You start having memory impairment at about 0.03. Doesn't mean that you can't remember stuff and you're not in a blackout yet, but you have, it's an access problem. In order to have judgment, you have to have memory. Yellow means stop. If you're not in the intersection, it doesn't mean go faster. Like we do in LA. Well, I do it here too, but, all right? So, he was at weight 175. He said he didn't feel a buzz until double, nearly double legally drunk. 0.15, right? And so, so asking her how much she drank, because this didn't add up. What do you mean you had only two coolers? Two 12 ounce coolers? No, two two liter bottles. In other words, she matched him dose for dose. Now, my chart does it, so you should know that, well, well, we'll get to another chart that basically shows this. The lethal dose for a naive adult, that is naive meaning they don't have any drug tolerance. The lethal dose for a naive adult with alcohol is between 0.45 to 0.50. You should know that the police regularly pull over drunk drivers who blow 0.55. That is to say, most other people would be dead. These people are conscious and driving automobiles because of their tolerance. We also regularly lose through drinking games in college, college students at about 0.35. A 12-year-old middle school girl was sent to Sacred Heart behind three beers and a shot of vodka, and her blood alcohol level was um, 0.21. So here's the range, right? So alcohol is a drug, drugs come in doses, and one of the things that is helpful is to be able to teach people about, okay, let's break down how many doses you took versus what happened to you. So let's see, Here we go. All right, so consumer education, it's kind of necessary. So, because it doesn't occur usually in the collected social structures like family. So, for example, if we don't do consumer education when they come to us with a problem, it's probably not going to happen anywhere else. Because family struck conditions, social education, healthcare, advertising, economy, they, it produces predictable effects by which we can measure for illumination using what I call social math. So, mega death. He is not a rock band. So mega is a million, kilo is a thousand. Megadeth was coined by the Pentagon to describe the collateral damage, also known as the civilian death toll, when you airburst a four megaton nuclear device over a target city like, for example, Los Angeles. All right? So the death statistics I'm about to show you are from the 2000. Year 2000 Surgeon General Report. Excess mortality. Excess meaning uh, these are happening more than we'd expect. So to be valid, a doctor had to certify cause of death to make this list. So we use social math. And so basically when you see 450,000 deaths per year, uh, 
that's a big number. So what, what we do with social math as a, as a technique is we basically take the number of deaths per year, 2000 was a leap year, so 366 days. We divide that into a daily rate. We get 1,230 deaths per day. And then we go to the Boeing website and we take an airframe. That is a configuration. So this is a cargo jet. This is a passenger 747 because cargo contains more people, but we have to do seats, right? Okay, so the daily t death from tobacco. This is active smokers. Is three fully, seven, fully loaded 747s crashing every day. That's the year 2000 stat. Passive inhalation kills 53,000 a year or 144 people a day. One MD-80, Alaska Flight 261, which was, had a bunch of Eugene people on it that crashed off the coast of LA. One of those crashing every day. Alcohol deaths, 150,000 deaths a year, 410 people a day. One MD-11 crashing every day. Now understand what this stat is. The alcohol stat isn't crashes or murders. The alcohol stat is cancers, cirrhosis of the liver, diabetes. Okay, the murder and the crash stat is completely separate. All these statistics are by taking the drug the way the manufacturer intended it to be used. And you said only active, so like if someone died of diabetes and they were not still drinking, they didn't count it? Well, it was, it, they listed it as cause of death okay. on the death certificate. So active smokers, yeah, you died of cancer or emphysema, whatever. Passive smokers, I didn't smoke at all, I just worked in a bar. And I still got cancer and died. So with alcohol, so for, so for example, when I showed you those collateral statistics uh, from monitoring the future, so there's at least 1,500 K through 12 alcohol deaths a year, which is about a classroom every week. So if you you know ever had a classmate die, you know in your K through 12, so imagine a classroom a week. College consumption, binge drinking. Uh, at least 40% is freshmen, 10% a year drop out due to, of the freshman class, drop out due to alcohol alone. That's in uh, two-year schools and four-year schools. In 2003, there were 1,400 deaths from alcohol poisoning, so cars, falls, car accidents, and also poisoning, directly related to alcohol. And the LC stat, well, LCC stat varies according to population where we see higher binge drinking rates among um, high school equivalency GED students as opposed to, say, the general population. So 50% of the high school completion students, 28% general, which is still relatively high compared to the rest of the population. Prescription drugs, 100,000 deaths, 230 pe 273 people a day, 1,757. So think Heath Ledger. Wasn't a drug addict, but had a bad combination. You know, duly medicated. And then illegal drugs. And where I got this statistic was essentially doubling the Don network. So Don is drug abuse warning network, it's ERs. So if you go to an ER with an overdose of meth or coke or something like that, you get on a Don statistic. I'm not sure whether Sacred Heart or Riverbend is on Don network. I haven't gotten an answer from that when I've asked, so I'm gonna assume not. The Don statistic for 2000 was 7,000 people, which sounded a bit low to me. So I doubled it. And even if you, I mean, could you believe that 14,000 people died of drug overdoses in the United States in the year 2000? Is that a stretch? No. Okay, so even at that rate, that's only 38 people a day. 
right? So or two Gulfstream business jets a day. 19 people each. So when we talk about essentially a war on drugs and a murmur on tobacco, hall and pharmaceuticals, those are all preventable deaths. Illegal drugs kill 38 people a day. They're also preventable deaths. Legal drugs kill 55 times more people a day. Do we focus on illegal drugs because the cartels don't have lobbyists? Well, they do, but why are we doing that? So rather than go through the good drug, bad drug, legal drug, illegal drug, let's just say addiction is addiction and people mix and match and let's just get them off of everything, treatment on demand. So let me skip through this. So, in teaching people about what you substitute or what they could substitute for their addictions that would be healthy, NIDA, for example, that is the National Institute of Drug Abuse, basically says that natural rewards are things, things like food, water, sex, and nurturing, that you need to be healthy. And that some, the, the idea is that Sometimes addictions are substitute for these very basic needs. So when they define addiction, they say a state in which an organism engages in compulsive behavior. The behavior is reinforcing. Question? Um, so why isn't um, sleep on that list? <laughs> why isn't sleep on that list? Yeah. It's part of nurturing. <laughs> and you're a student. You're not supposed to. Sl oh, just kidding. So behavior is reinforcing, rewarding, or pleasurable, and there's loss of control and limiting intake. So dependence in the medical field is synonymous with addiction. So when they talk about being chemically dependent, you're addicted. Okay, this drug will develop dependence. That's a kinder, gentler way of saying addiction, but that's what they mean. So the term addiction is more laden with, uh, shall we say, baggage. So if you've never heard of these words, neuroplasticity and nociception, or nociception, or nociception, neuroplasticity. Basically what it is, is that it refers to nerves or brain and plastic moldable, not the material, but that your brain changes. Uh, this is basically uh, from findings in neuroscience that said that where we used to think that, oh, once you, were, you turn five or once you finished puberty, then your brain was set. And there were no changes. Well, we found out that that's not the case, that the brain changes, especially in response to um, <laughs> drugs, especially in, in response to trauma, and also uh, healthful behavior, too. So neuroplasticity, it's one concept. And it recurs on a variety of levels, ranging from cellular uh, changes due to learning. So learning changes your brain positively. The large-scale changes involved in remapping in response to injury, meaning that if your brain gets damaged, it attempts to reroute across the damaged signals and form new pathways. Nociception is the process of encoding and processing noxious stimuli, particularly pain. The afferent activity produced in the peripheral and central nervous system by stimuli that have potential to damage uh, tissue. This activity is initiated by nosis receptors, nociceptors, also called pain receptors, that can detect mechanical, thermal, or chemical changes above a set threshold. Once stimulated, a nociceptor transmits a signal along the spinal cord 
to the brain. So the reason I bring up nociception is at a certain level, the brain interprets excess drugs beyond neurotransmitter as damage. So when I've basically used the image of the cartoon image of, you know, remember Wile E. Coyote and the Roadrunner dropping safe on the brain responds to drug to drugs like it's a safe being dropped on it. And part of recovery is basically going through the boredom process, which is the brain's response to healing from drug addiction. The brain is expecting a piano to fall, and it isn't. So boredom is like, you know, like when you cut your finger and you stop the blood and you, know, you cover it up. The healing process of the cut is like itching. That's one of the most annoying thing. Boredom is itching for the brain. <laughs> um, that depends on the drug. And that depends on how you want to define, you know, yeah, what kind of boredom is it? So, for example, let's take meth, for example. Okay? So, according to brain scans, MRIs and such, um... It takes three years of continuous abstinence to recover as far as you're going to recover from meth. Now, where you are with boredom within that time is an open question. But uh, part of what uh, meth is is basically like almost like an addiction to intensity. And so when you don't have, when it isn't intense, well, to Americans, anything that isn't intense is boredom. You know, like, for example, when we talk about eye disorders, people who can't live without their cell phones will go through cell phone withdrawal. That's like an addiction to intensity that's caused by an electronic device. All right? So there's, lots of, there's ways of diff dealing with boredom. So I'm going to skip this directly to go into DSM 4 and 5. Well, 5 hasn't come out yet. Substance dependence. A maladaptive pattern of substance use leading to clinically significant impairment or distress manifested by three or more of the following occurring at any time in the same 12-month period. Tolerance, defined by either of the following. Need for markedly increased amounts of the substance to feel intoxication or desired effect. Markedly diminished effects with continued use of the same amount of the substance. And withdrawal as manifested by either of the following. The characteristic withdrawal syndrome for the substance. And the same substance is taken to relieve or avoid withdrawal symptoms. So substance dependence, read addiction, clinical medical definition of addiction, is characterized by tolerance and withdrawal. Now, the only problem with this is it doesn't fit all drugs, like LSD as an example. Would you consider 90 to 120 days of continuous use of LSD to be addictive? In school. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Why? <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> we have a colleague in the field, uh, a friend of mine, Bruce, who broke my high school, who actually set and broke his own record in my high school for continuous days on LSD in high school. And he's an addiction therapist in the county. He did it while he was at school? Or like he was at school, school, yes. Dropped acid at school. <laughs> 90 continuous days. And then 120 continuous days. Why? He, can, well, he basically you know, characterized himself as a garbage head. Now, the reason that I mention this up in this context, 
LSD builds up tolerance, but there's no withdrawal. In fact, with abstinence, you, back, you return to your original tolerance. So it doesn't fit this pattern, but that's pretty much the only drug that does that. There might be others, you know, other psychedelic class drugs, but... All right, so substance dependence, tolerance and withdrawal, right? So we could see that with our high school couple. They might have started out with a beer or a glass of wine, but they quickly went up to 20 doses as normal behavior. And they had whopping genetic tolerance to, to combine with that. Okay, substance is often taken in larger amounts or over a longer period than was intended. Persistent desire or unsuccessful efforts to cut down or control substance use. Great deal of time is spent in activities necessary to obtain the substance or recover from its effects. Important social, occupational, or recreational activities are given up or reduced because of substance use. The substance use is continued despite knowledge of having a persistent or recurrent physical or psychological problem that is likely to have been caused or made worse, exacerbated by the substance. Current cocaine use despite recognition of cocaine-induced depression or continued drinking despite recognition that an ulcer was made worse by alcohol consumption, etc., etc. Okay, which describes essentially, you know, why, why we're in understanding addictive behavior because we've got to know what the scientific de definition is. Right? So tolerance of withdrawal, continued use despite negative consequences. Now, this is basically different than abuse, which is also in a category. So it's a maladaptive pattern of substance use leading to a clinically significant impairment or distress as mani manifested by one or more of the following within a 12-month period. Recurring use in a failure to fulfill male, major role obligations at work, school, or home. Repeated absences or poor work performance, etc. Recurring use in situations in which it's physically hazardous, driving an automobile under the influence. <coughs> Recurrent substance-related legal problems. Continued use despite having persistent or recurrent social interpersonal problems caused or exacerbated by this use of the effects of the substance. Now, notice within abuse, which is considered a lower category than addiction, there's no mention of tolerance and withdrawal. But it's generally within this framework, assume that abuse will lead to dependence. Symptoms have never met the criteria for substance abuse dependence, and that's in the other piece within it. Okay, so an addiction is goal-oriented. So anything, a substance or a process, can be addicting if it's psychoactive, that is, changes how you perceive, think, or feel. So with neuroplasticity, your use changes your brain. Recovery changes your brain, too. But within recovery, the, sl the change is slower because it's internal. That's where the boredom piece comes in. Because the changes don't occur as fast as using because you're healing. You're rebuilding rather than tearing down. All right? So nothing must become addicting. The goal within addiction is brain reward, either pleasure or absence of pain. So it's characterized by tolerance. You need more to get the same effect. And dependence required to feel or function as normal and withdrawal in the absence of addictive experience or it's the opposite of effect. Withdrawal is often the body's attempt to return to normal or the mind becoming bored. So boredom can be part of recovery, but you actually have to know, learn how to, thanks, negotiate that. Okay, so this definition basically covers also sugar and salt as food additives, which affect mood, and they're often hidden behind their chemical names. Sodium, dextrose, high fructose corn syrup, caffeine, 
coffee, theophylline, tea, theobromine, chocolate, matin and mate, tobacco, alcohol and pharmaceuticals, gambling, internet day trading, shopping, overspending, chronic debting, video games, underground economy drugs. So nothing must become addicting. But if you, often, if you have to lie about it, it's probably an addictive process for you. And can you give it up for six months to a year? Or three years? For starters, can you do that? If you can't, well, how about a detox period? Okay, so looking at your willingness to do that. Because people will ask, well, is this addictive? Well, there's some basic tests for that. So, getting into uh, epigenetics in the last five minutes before we get into the drugs. So the old biology, based on a Darwinian, Darwinian, Darwinian Newtonian model, held that human beings, like all animals, are biologically programmed by DNA and evolution to compete. In the Newtonian view, this programming essentially makes us like robots, chemical protein robots, destined to struggle against or play out billions of years of evolution. Well, you can't help it, it's in your genes. You're ADHD, you know, you've got multiple generations of substance abuse, you're going to be yada, yada, yada. Well, no. Okay, so Newton, cause and effects, mechanistic cause and effect and Darwin, survival of the fittest. So, addiction in that, those view becomes a goal-oriented response to the addition of a drug and the mechanics of tolerance withdrawal and so on. Right? So there are people that actually treat relatively successfully using this view. So modern medicine essentially works from a Newtonian model. Okay, well, if you're addicted to a drug, we'll give you another drug to get you off the first drug. Or don't worry about being addicted to this drug. You're under therapy. You're not an addict. And when time comes time to take you off this drug, we'll give you another drug to take you off the first drug. Cause and effect. Copy that, thanks. So, given disease condition A, take drug B to produce healthy condition C and experience side effects D, E, F. Okay, we're connecting, we're correcting a chemical imbalance. So, when we talk about neuroplasticity, we also have to take into account the drugs they're giving us have certain effects within our nervous system as well. So, my opinion is your DNA code involved, evolved in a balance with its environment, which not only involved competition, but symbiosis with other organisms, sometimes even incorporating the DNA of those organisms as part of itself and those experiences. So you're not just a machine, you're a set of relationships. Some of those are healthy, some of those are not. So we'll continue this on Thursday. Mm-hmm. Where are we getting our grades from our papers? Can you see the grades in the grade book? Yeah. I have to talk with those. Yeah, I, I've been trying to get them visible. Yeah. So don't worry about that yet. All right. Also, are we supposed to start our addiction inventory? Yeah, you could start that now. Yeah.